under the leadership of the head of that particular the chair of that committee, okay, what do we need to prepare for? What needs to be in place in order for us to do this? Well, part of it, of course, was spending money, but part of it was giving money to our colleagues to actually play with some possibilities. And we came up with some grants, some of them fairly large, $100,000 and more, to build some things within faculties. These were planting seeds, these were preparing the university for where we may go. Not just technically, not just financially, but I would argue psychologically. And then you act. And the next thing you know, you got a guy teaching introductory, an, Eng an introductory English writing course in which almost all of the writing is done online. The feedback is given that way and when 200 people come into the room together for their regular now once a week meeting, they've got something very different to talk about. So action and then somehow to sustain it. Uh, you see the word relapse there, of course. Remember, this is from smoking. And then also other behaviors where you kind of kind of break a habit and then, oh no, I went back to it. One of the problems with people when they do this is they think they're not relapsing, they think rather they've lost it. I knew I couldn't do this, it's all fallen apart and it's done. And one of the great contributions of the stages of change model to those folks was they reframed what that moment was. It was not a failure. It was in fact, for some, a perfectly natural return to an earlier stage. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. So uh, for you and I uh, with technology, when we kind of throw up our hands and say, oh gosh, can't I just talk to this person? And the answer may be no, because they're in South Africa. <laughs> So that's stages of change, and it, the assumption there is that it's stepwise. And you can you notice all of the arrows. This this particular version of this uh, has uh, you know enough arrows in it for a, a Mel Gibson movie. And I, I you need to. I'm thinking of the one where he played the Scottish guy and did that wonderful. You know, this could be the last day of your life, um, but be good. Uh, but those arrows indicate that we, yes, we may move through stages, but we zip back and forth among them and we, would, we think we're ready, then we step back and think again. And uh, I think adopting change in learning technology is just one of the ripest grounds for procrastination in human existence. And this model helps us understand why. And then the third one, Oh, just before this is, yeah, uh, a new version of uh, iTunes is available. Download now. I hate this message because I didn't know. I was pre-contemplative. It was great. Download now. In other words, I want to say back, no, you're moving me through the stages of change model too quickly. <laughs> you're meant to say a new version of iTunes is available. Please think about this. I will send you another prompt in 20 minutes. <laughs> And then the next prompt is, a uh, new version of iTunes is available. What do we need to do to get ready for this? <laughs> and then finally the last one would be, download now. And the maintenance one's a joke because two weeks later they're going to send me another message. <laughs> the diffusion of uh, innovation, <clears throat> the Rogers work, a number of you will have seen this. And almost all of you will be familiar with the language that hopefully you can read across the bottom of the graph. From the innovators to the early adopters, to the early majority, to the late majority, to the <laughs> laggards. Uh, this language is of course problematic from a psychologist's perspective. It is just a little judgment laden. <laughs> As someone who finds himself in what I thought was the top 16%, <laughs> apparently not. Apparently that's the ugly 16%. Uh, and being a laggard is no fun. So uh, this a bell curve is a theoretical distribution, of course, of where some of us sit, but the idea is there are people who are on that bleeding edge, 2.5%, who are continually changing. I have a friend who plays golf this way, and I need to tell you he's terrible. <laughs> I just think he's got a swing that he can work with, and I come out a month later and play with him again, and everything's changed. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just trying some things. What do you mean trying some things? Your score is 20 shots worse than it was when we played last. Yeah, but I have to try some things. That's what golf is to me. Golf is an opportunity to innovate and lose balls. <laughs> <laughs> the, the descriptions, uh, this describes really for us the pace at which you would move through st stages of change once you are contemplative. So you start thinking about something some people in this room 
will move to action very quickly. Because that's where your excitement is. That's where your fun is. That's how you think of yourself as an educator, moving quickly to these new things. There'll be others in the room who don't want to move that quickly to action. The problem, as I've said, with the Rogers model, in my view, and I'm not the only one who believes this, is that we appear to be critical of those who want to move more slowly through a stages of change model. And sometimes we actually don't have the luxury of that time, to be fair, but sometimes we do. So just coming back, this is about choosing to get in. This isn't about just adapting to quick changes. Going back to that, you don't need to be able to read this thing again, but that little two by two, where in this one, we've got uh, our, we're choosing our, our own path, but we're choosing to make a pretty big change. And that's uh, what the notion of diffusion of innovation tells us. So the point I would take away from this is, oh, by the way, there are a couple of other assumptions here. You can see we get up to 100%. I mean, the assumption here is, it's coming, folks. You know, you can sit there calmly. You can bury your head in the sand. We can hand out big paper bags, and you can put them over your heads, but it's coming. So your choice is, get in now or get in later, but you're getting in. And for some of us, that's a disquieting notion. That flies in the face of stages of change. It says, okay, we've got you contemplative. Know that we're pushing you to action. Now, that isn't always a bad thing, but some people feel a loss of control when that happens. Okay. One final, uh, very important consideration. Change affects identity. Yeah, I've got a moment to ask this question. I want you to think about a question for a moment. If I, had to, uh, if I asked you to describe yourself as a teacher, the teacher in you, using individual words, one word, a couple of words, three words, think about a word or two that would come to mind. For some of you, that'll be very quick and easy to do because you've got a file in your head you can go to very quickly. It's very accessible, probably because you go to it a lot. And you've got words or thoughts in there. Psychologists like to call those self schemas. So there are things about yourself that you can make judgments about very quickly. Other things you've really got to think about. I don't, I don't know. I never really thought about it. Now, I, my, I asked my 90-year-old father the other day, Dad, you're going to be moving into a new place. What will a good day look like? He said, you mean, like weather? <laughs> mm -mm, no. What you do? Well, I stumped him. I stumped him. He said, jeez, never really thought about what a good day for me is like. This is a remarkably other-directed person. You know, if somebody asked me, I'd be able to lay it out in minutes. So, well, first of all, you're going to have, uh, you know, the breakfast is going to be edible, but uh, it doesn't have to be eggs. And I mean, I, think, I could easily think that all through because I think about myself and my good days all the time. <laughs> and my father would say, Gary, get over it. <laughs> what were some words? Anybody want to just say out a word or two? Yeah. Encouraging. Encouraging. Perspective. Perspective. Neat. Others? Open. Open. Think of the antonyms, by the way. You know, discouraging, closed, lack of perspective. Other words? Reflective. Reflective. Thank you. Effective. Effective. Innovative. Innovative. Empathetic. Empathetic. Well, you get the idea. When I do that for myself, uh, the word patient comes to mind. It's very positive. I like to think of myself in positive terms. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, I'm not always. And when I'm not, now there's a problem because I'm violating a sense of who I think I am. Hmm? Another word that I would use is contact. 
I believe it's very, very important to establish some degree of contact with students. And when I'm not establishing contact, I don't think I'm teaching. I think I'm doing something else. So some change violates my sense of patience and violates my sense of contact, which violates, to a certain extent, <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> I think I can probably fix I'm this. Sorry I did that. Oh, that's all right. Uh, I think we did something like. Oh, you go ahead. Sorry, just just so that everybody knows, we're doing a, a live radio broadcast right now, and our feed went dead. So I just need to reset. Oh, that. Sorry, it's very great. That's not a problem. There we are. It's perfect right there. That's good. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot to welcome people around the world. <laughs> you know, the, uh, it, it, if, I, if I hadn't gone into academics, I, I wanted to be a baseball play-by-play -play, uh, announcer. And this is as close as I'm going to get, so <laughs> it's a thrill for me. So in short then, uh, change can assault our sense of who we are as teachers. This is not trivial, and I don't think uh, I am um, overstating it. There's a beautiful article written in the Physics Education Journal about five award-winning physicists, people who won awards for their teaching and their research. And they taught the huge Physics 100 classes. You know, they, they went where no one else would go. <laughs> they were uh, asked to consider new ways of teaching that research, physics education research, showed to be, here's the rub, more effective than what they had done for up to 25 years. In fact, some of the disquieting research, some of you will know, that's, comes out, that's come out of research education, uh, sorry, physics education research, suggests that what felt so good at the time didn't stick at all. And that what happens to students based on measures of things like their, their knowledge of concepts, force concepts in physics, actually gets worse as the course goes on. Their sense of efficacy, their ability, that they, they, their belief that they can do physics gets worse as the course goes on. And their belief that physics matters, <laughs> of course, gets worse as the course goes on if those other things are in place. So not only were these people not perhaps doing a good job for 25 years. They were doing a lousy job, and now they had research to prove it, and they sat these folks down and said, what do you think of this? <laughs> a quote from the paper that summarizes these people's responses. These faculty care about their students and have done their best with the knowledge they possessed and under the circumstances they found themselves. An important part of their identity is their role as an expert teacher. It is difficult for them when they perceive that the research community is telling them that they have been doing it all wrong and perhaps even causing harm to their students. Not unexpectedly, their reaction can be defensive. <laughs> Remember, these are dedicated folks, and the changes they're being asked to make assault their sense of who they are. And I think we need to really respect that. So what can we learn from this? Uh, let's see if there's a couple of things that we can take home. One of them is, uh, for all encounters with change, gauge your sense of perceived personal control. We actually tend to underestimate it. Interestingly, I, I, uh, Tony might know the exact year, but I think we're going back about 12 years or more when at UCLA an edict came down from on high saying that every course must have a web presence. And the faculty at UCLA went nuts at this. Over our virtually dead bodies, they said. <laughs> and there was a huge hue and cry, not just at UCLA but elsewhere. Sociologists at York uh, was quick to say, you see, this is the problem with the way change is being implemented in the learning technology realm. Well, zip forward 12 years and you'd be hard pressed to find a course at UCLA that doesn't have a web presence. But not because it was mandated from on high, but because decisions were made individually and collectively to do so. So we tend to have a little more personal control than we might perceive at times. Don't type yourself. In other words, don't say, I'm an early adopter. I'm a laggard. I'm a whatever. Rather, uh, I think it behooves us uh, as academics to assess the pros and cons of every change and act accordingly. Some of them you move quickly on, some of them you won't. That's what thoughtful people do. 
and at the same time acknowledge that you might have some tendencies regarding change. You know certain change is easy and quick for you, others not so much. And you might say, I'm reacting against this. Is it because it's a bad idea or because I just put this in my bad idea file and I need to talk to other people about it, other people I respect, and then also other people who I disagree with. <laughs> not just my pals who would say, yes, Gary, you're right. You've always been right. That's what I like about you, Gary. <laughs> but rather people like Tony who say to me, why? I need, I, you know, we need that for sure. And the last point would be, try to avoid what I might call hardening of the identity. Yes, you have words that describe you as teachers. You value those, and I deeply respect those uh, things you value. It is in large part why you bother to come to events like this. You don't have to. But you do, and you put in this kind of extra time and extra belief. So I don't want to mess with that sense. But I have, over the last 30 years, worked with a number of faculty members who, when, it, when given a possibility of making a particular change, said simply, I could never do that. Okay, why not? It just wouldn't be comfortable for me. Now, we need to respect that and explore it, but I, I'm telling you, I don't want us to stop there. Parker Palmer did say, we teach who we are. Okay, that's that's worth respecting. What I would push back with is, and how, how varied, how big, how broad, how exciting, how flexible are we? Technology invites us to ask that question of ourselves. That's both the daunting side of it and the great fun of it. So uh, as Tony takes over and takes us through some things, those are just a few things that will be running through my head in addition to why and why not. Thanks.